Welcome to Thornwillow's Centennial Reading of Ulysses. We are celebrating James Joyce's literary masterpiece by presenting the entire novel through a tapestry of hundreds of clips that unite readers across the world. Many thanks to our readers for volunteering to participate in our centennial celebration. Episode 5, The Lotus Eaters, featuring Salman Rushdie, reading from New York City, Aideen Maloney, reading from East Harlem, Turtle Bunbury, reading from County Carlow in Ireland, and Michael Schwartz, reading from Brooklyn. By lorries, along Sir John Rogerson's Quay, Mr. Bloom walked soberly past Windmill Lane, Leesk's, the Linseed Crushers, the Postal Telegraph Office, could have given that address too, and past the Sailor's Home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages, a boy for the skins lolled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fag butt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask hoop. Tell him if he smokes, he won't grow. Oh, let him. His life is in such a bed of roses, waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come home to Ma, Da. Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, past the frowning face of Bethel. Oh, yes, house of Aleph Beth. And past Nichols the Undertaker's. At eleven it is. Time enough. Dare say Corny Kelleher bagged that job for O'Neill's, singing with his eyes shut, Corny. Met her once in the park, in the dark, what a lark. Police tout. Her name and address she then told, with by Turaloom Turaloom Te. Oh, surely he begged it. Bury him cheap, you know what you may call, with my Turaloom Turaloom, Turaloom Turaloom. In Westland Row, he halted before the window of the Belfast and Oriental Tea Company and read the legends of lead-papered packets, choice blend, finest quality, family tea. Rather warm, tea, must get some from Tom Kernan. Couldn't ask him at a funeral, though. While his eyes still read blandly, he took off his hat, quietly inhaling his hair oil, and sent his right hand with slow grace over his brow and hair. Very warm morning. Under their dropped lids, his eyes found the tiny bow of the leather headband inside his high-grade hat. Just there. His right hand came down into the bowl of his hat. His fingers found quickly a card behind the headband and transferred it to his waistcoat pocket. So warm. His right hand once more slowly went over again, choice blend made of the finest Ceylon brands. The Far East, lovely spot it must be, the garden of the world, big lazy leaves to float about on, cactuses, flowery meads, snaky lianas, they call them, wonder is it like that. Those singalese lobbing around in the sun, in dolce far niente, not doing a hand's turn all day, sleep six months out of twelve, too hot to quarrel, influence of the climate, lethargy, flowers of idleness, the air feeds most, azotes, hothouse in botanic gardens, sensitive plants, water lilies, petals too tired to, sleeping sickness in the air, walk on rose leaves, imagine trying to eat tripe and cow heel, where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere, ah, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back, reading a book with a parasol open, couldn't sink if you tried, so thick with salt. Because the weight of the water, no, the weight of the body in the water, is equal to the weight of the, or is it the volume, is equal of the weight? It's a law, something like that. Vance in high school, cracking his finger joints, teaching. The college curriculum, cracking curriculum. What is weight, really, when you say the bodies per second per second? They all fall to the ground. The earth, it's the force of gravity of the earth, is the weight. He turned away and sauntered across the road. How did she walk like, with her sausages? 
like that something. As he walked, he took the folded Freeman from his side pocket, unfolded it, rolled it lengthwise in a baton, and tapped it, it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. Careless air, just drop in to see. Per second, per second. Per second for every second, it means. From the curbstone, he darted a keen glance through the door of the post office. Too late, box. Post here. No one in. He handed the card through the brass grill. Are there any letters for me, he asked. While the postmistress searched a pigeonhole, he gazed at his recruit at the recruiting poster with soldiers of all arms on parade and held the top of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh primed rag paper. No answer, probably. Went too far last time. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower, Esquire, care of P.O. Westland Row, City. Answered, anyhow. He slipped card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment, cast-off soldier? There, bearskin cap and hackle plume. No, he's a grenadier. Pointed cuffs, there he is, Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Red coats, too showy. That must be why the women go after them. Uniform, easier to enlist and drill. Maud Gunn's letter about taking them off O'Connell Street at night, disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now. An army rotten with venereal disease. Overseas or half seas over empire. Half baked they look, hypnotized like. Ice front, mark time. Table, able, bed, ed, the king's own. Never see him dressed up as a fireman or a, ho or a bobby. A mason, yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned to the right. Talk, as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket and a forefinger felt his way under the flap of the envelope, zipping it open in jerks. Women will pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter and crumpled the envelope in his pocket. Something pinned on. Photo, perhaps? Hair? No. McCoy, get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. Hate company when you... Hello, Bloom. Where are you off to? Hello, McCoy. Nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine. How are you? Just keeping alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black tie and clothes, he asked with low respect. Is there any... No trouble, I hope. I see you're... Oh, no, Mr. Broom said. Poor, Dign poor Dignam, you know. The funeral is today. Oh, to be sure, poor fellow, so it is. What time? A photo it isn't. A badge, maybe. Uh, Eleven, Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out there, McCoy said. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. Who was telling me? Hollahan. You know Hoppy? I know. Mr. Bloom gazed across the road at the outsider, drawn up before the door of the Grosvenor. The porter hoisted the valise up on the well. She stood still, waiting, while the man, husband, brother, like her, searched his pockets for change. Stylish kind of coat with that roll collar, warm for a day like this, looks like blanket cloth. Careless stand of her with her hands in those patch pockets, like that haughty creature at the polo match. Women, all fur cast till you touch the spot. Handsome is, and handsome does. Reserved, about to yield. The Honourable Mrs. and Brutus is an honourable man. Possess her once, take the starch out of her. I was with Bob Doran. He's on one of his periodical bends. And what do you call him? Bantam Lyons, just down there in Conway's we were. Doran, Lyons in Conway's. She raised a gloved hand to her hair. In came Hoppy. Having a wet, drawing back his head and gazing far from beneath his veiled eyelids, he saw the bright fawn skin shine in the glare, the braided drums. Clearly, I can see today, 
moisture about, gives long sight perhaps, talking of one thing or another. Lady's hand, which side will she get up? And he said, uh, sad thing about our poor friend Paddy. What Paddy, I said? Poor little Paddy Dignam, he said. Off to the country. Broadstone, probably. High brown boots with laces dangling. Well-turned foot. What is he fostering over that change for? Sees me looking. Eye out for the other fellow, always. Good fallback. Two strings to her bow. Why, I said. What's wrong with him, I said. Proud. Rich. Silk stockings. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He moved a little to the side of McCoy's talking head. Getting up in a minute. What's wrong with him, he said. He's dead, he said. And faith, he filled up. Is it Paddy Dignam, I said. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I was with him no later than Friday last, or Thursday was it, in the arch. Yes, he said. He's gone. He died on Monday, poor fellow. Watch, watch. Silk flash, rich stockings, white. Watch. The heavy tram car honking. It's gong spewed between. Lost it. Curse your noisy pug nose. Feels locked out of it. Paradise at the Perry, always happening like that. The very moment. Girl in Eustace Street, hallway Monday. Was it settling her garter? Her friend covering the display of esprit de corps. Well, what are you gaping at? Yes, yes, Mr. Bloom said after a dull sigh. Another gone. One of the best, McCoy said. The tram passed. They drove off towards the loop line bridge, her rich gloved hand on the steel grip. Flicker, flicker, the lace flare of her hat in the sun. Flicker, flick. Wife well, I suppose, McCoy's changed voice said. Oh, yes, Bloom said. Tip top, thanks. He unrolled the newspaper baton idly and read idly. What is home without plum trees potted meat? Incomplete. With it, an abode of bliss. My missus has just got an engagement. At least it's not settled yet. The least tack again, by the way, no harm. I'm, I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large lidded eyes with unhasty friendliness. My wife too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast, on the 25th. That's so, McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom. Not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom, eating bread and... No book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man. Cat furry, black ball, torn strip of envelope. Love's old sweet song comes love's old... It's a kind of tour, don't you see, Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his moustache stubble. Oh, well, he said, that's good news. He moved to go. Well, Glad to see you looking fit, he said. Meet you knocking around. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tell you what, McCoy said. You might put down my name at the funeral, will you? I'd like to go, but I mightn't be able. You see, there's a drowning case at Sandy Cove may turn up, and then the coroner and myself would have to go down if the body is found. You just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Bloom said, moving to get off. That'll be all right. Right, McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'd go if I possibly could. Well, tell all. Just C.P. McCoy will do. That will be done, Mr. Bloom answered firmly. Didn't catch me napping that wheeze. The quick touch. Salt mark, I'd like my job. Valise, I have a particular fancy for. Leather, capped corners, riveted edges, double action, lever lock. Bob Cowley lent him his for the Wick Wicklow Regatta concert last year. Never heard tidings of it from that good day to this. Mr. Bloom, strolling towards Brunswick Street. 
smiled. My missus has just gotten reedy, freckled soprano, cheese-pairing nose, nice enough in its way for a little ballad, no guts in it. You and me, don't you know, in the same boat, soft-soaping, give you that needle that would, can't you hear the difference? Think he's that way inclined a bit, against my grain somehow, thought that Belfast would fetch him. I hope that smallpox up there doesn't get worse. Suppose she wouldn't let herself be vaccinated again, your wife and my wife. Wonder is he pimping after me? Mr. Bloom stood at the corner, his eyes wandering over the multicoloured hoardings. Cantrell and Cochrane's ginger ale, aromatic. Cleary's summer ale. No, he's going on straight. Hello. Leah tonight. Mrs. Banman Palmer. Like to see her in that again. Hamlet she played last night. Male impersonator. Perhaps she was a woman. Why Ophelia committed suicide? Poor papa. How he used to talk about Kate Bateman in that. Outside the Adelphi in London. Waited all the afternoon to get in. Year before I was born, that was. 65. And Ristori in Vienna. What, what is this the, the right name is? By Mosenthal it is. Rachel, is it? No, the scene he was always talking about where the old blind Abraham recognizes the voice and puts his fingers on his face. Nathan's voice, his son's voice. I hear the voice of Nathan who left his father to the grief and misery in my arms, who left the house of his father and left the God of his father. Every word is so deep, Leopold. Poor papa. Poor man. I'm glad I didn't go into the room to look at his face. That day. Oh dear. Oh dear. Phew. Well, perhaps it was the best for him. Mr. Bloom went round the corner and passed the drooping nags of the hazard. No use thinking of it any more. Nosebag time. Wish I hadn't met that McCoy fellow. My name is Aideen Maloney and I was born and raised in Dublin, Ireland. I'm an actress and I'm the founder and the producing artistic director of a New York theatre company, Fallen Angel. I was 10 years of age when I first read Ulysses and since then I've had a lifelong obsession with James Joyce and his work. I played Eva Joyce, James Joyce's sister, in the film Nora. And about 17 years ago, I began an adaptation of the Penelope chapter, Molly Bloom's soliloquy, for the stage. Uh, in early 2019, my dear friend and colleague, Colin McCann, uh, joined forces with me on the adaptation and Yes, Reflections of Molly Bloom was premiered by the Irish Repertory Theatre in June 2019 to great acclaim. He came nearer and heard a crunching of gilded oats, the gently champing teeth. Their full book eyes regarded him as he went by amid the sweet oaten reek of horse piss. Their El Dorado. Poor chokinses. Damn all they know or care about anything with their long noses stuck in nose bags. Too full for words. Still, they get their feed all right and their dust. Gelded too. A stump of black gutta percha wagging limp between their haunches. I'd be happy all the same that way. Good poor brutes they look. Still, their neigh can be very irritating. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded it into the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabman's shelter. Curious the life of drifting cabbies, all weathers, all places, time or set down, no will of their own. Voglio a non. Like to give them an odd cigarette, sociable, shout a few flying syllables as they pass. He hummed. He turned into Cumberland Street and 
going on some paces, halted in the lee of the station wall. No one. Mead's timber yard, piled box, ruins and tenements. With careful tread, he passed over a hopscotch court with its forgotten picky stone. Not a sinner. Near the timber yard, a squatted child at marbles, alone, shooting the tall with a cunny thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watched from her warm cell. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle not to wake her. Open it. And once I played marbles when I went to that old dame's school. She liked mignonette. Mrs. Ellis's and mister. He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower. I think it's a, a yellow flower with flattened petals. <laughs> Not annoyed then. What does she say? Dear Henry, I got your last letter to me and thank you very much for it. I am sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I am awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other world. Please tell me what is the real meaning of that word? Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me what you think of poor me. I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often you have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about... Please write me a long letter and tell me more. Remember, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not wrote. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patience are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I have such a bad headache today and write by return to your longing Martha. P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use? I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhold, smelt its almost no smell and placed it in his heart pocket. Language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips, when you, darling man, flower, punish your cactus, if you don't, please pour forget-me-not. How I long violets to dear roses, when we soon anemone meet all naughty, night's dog wife Martha's perfume. Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his side pocket. Weak joy opened his lips. Changed since the first letter. Wonder did she wrote it herself. Doing the indignant, a girl of good family like me, respectable character, could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you. Not having any. Usual love scrimmage, then running round corners, bad as a row with Molly. Cigar has a cooling effect. Narcotic. Go further next time. Naughty boy. Punish. Afraid of words, of course. Brutal. Why not? Try it anyhow. A bit at a time. Fingering still the letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out. Common pin, eh? He threw it on the road, out of her clothes somewhere pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always have. No roses without thorns. Flat Dublin voices bawled in his head. Those two sluts that night in the coom linked together in the rain. 
Oh, Mary lost the pin of her draw. She didn't know what to do. To keep us up, to keep us up. It. Them. Such a bad headache. Has her roses, probably. Or sitting all day typing. I focus bad for stomach nerves. What perfume does your wife use? Now, could you make out a thing like that? To keep it up, Martha. Mary. I saw that picture somewhere. I forget now, old master or faked for money. He is sitting in their house talking. Mysterious. Also, the two sluts in the coom would listen to keep it up. <laughs> nice kind of evening feeling. No more wandering about. Just lull there, quiet dusk. Let everything rip. Forget. Tell about places you have been. Strange customs. The other one, jar on her head, was getting the supper, fruit, olives. Lovely cool water out of the well, stone cold, like the hole in the wall at Ashtown. Must carry a paper goblet next time I go to the trotting matches. She listens with big, dark, soft eyes. Tell her more and more all. Then a sigh, silence, long, long, long rest. Going under the railway arch, he took out the envelope, tore it swiftly in shreds and scattered them towards the road. The shreds fluttered away, sank in the dank air. A white flutter then all sank. Henry Flower. You could tear up a cheque for a hundred pounds in the same way. Simple bit of paper. Lord Ivy wants cashed a seven figure cheque for a million in the Bank of Ireland. Shows you the money to be made out of porter. Still, the other brother, Lord Ardalon, has to change his shirt four times a day, they say. Skin breeds lice or vermin. A million pounds. Wait a moment. Tuppence a pint. Fourpence a quart. Eightpence a gallon of porter. No, one and fourpence a gallon of porter. One and four into twenty. Fifteen, about. Yes, exactly. Fifteen millions of barrels of porter. What am I saying? Barrels? Gallons? About a million barrels all the same. An incoming train clanked heavily above his head. Coach after coach. Barrels bumped in his head. Dull porter slopped and churned inside. The bungholes sprang open and a huge dull flood leaked out flowing together, winding through mud flats all over the level land, a lazy pooling swirl of liquor bearing along wide-leaved flowers of its froth. My name is Turtle Bunbury. Uh, I'm a historian based in County Carlow, where I was raised and reared. Um, I got to know Joyce um, really kind of when I was uh, researching his daughter, Lucia, the, the sad story of Lucia Joyce, who fell head over heels in love with uh, Samuel Beckett uh, when Beckett was friendly with the Joyces at the tail end of the 1920s. But I kind of knew about Joyce before because I lived in the Dublin Docklands uh, and close to many of the, the places that he uh, would have written about in Ulysses and, and in the portrait. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was writing uh, a book called Ireland's Forgotten Past, and I was researching um, uh, this remarkable landscaping and canal building project that took place in Kerry uh, in the 17th century, in County Kerry, in the very southwest of Ireland. 
And, and to my great uh, delight, I realized that the guy who was overseeing the project, Sean Moore Shoga, uh, Big John Joyce, uh, he was the overseer and he was a direct ancestor of uh, James Joyce. So I love that sort of connection. Um, it's all loops within loops. That's Ireland for you. Um, this uh, edition, which I'll be reading from, uh, belongs uh, to my wonderful mother-in-law, Miriam. <clears throat> he had reached the open back door of All Hallows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat, took the card from his pocket, and tucked it again behind the leather headband. Damn it! I might have tried to work McCoy for a pass to Mullingar. Same notice on the door. Sermon by the very Reverend John Conmee, S.J., on St. Peter Claver and the African Mission. Save China's millions. Wonder how they explain it to the heathen Chinese. Prefer an ounce of opium. Celestials. Rank heresy for them. Prayers for the conversion of Gladstone they had too when he was almost unconscious. The Protestants the same. Convert Dr. William J. Walsh, D.D., to the true religion, Buddha, their god, lying on his side in the museum. Take, taking it easy with hand under his cheek, just sticks burning. Not like Getche Omo, crown of thorns and cross, clever idea. St. Patrick the Shamrock, chopsticks, con me. Martin Cunningham knows him, distinguished looking. Sorry I didn't work him about getting Molly into the choir instead of that Father Farley who looked a fool, but wasn't. The cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door and entered softly by the rear. Something going on. Some sodality. Pity so empty. Nice discreet place to be next some girl. Who is my neighbour? Jammed by the hour to slow music. That woman at midnight mass. Seventh heaven. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters round their necks, head bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stopped at each, took out a communion, shook a drop or two. Are they in water? Off it and put it neatly into her mouth. Her hat and head sank. Then the next one, a small old woman. The priest bent down to put it into her mouth, murmuring all the time, Latin. The next one, shut your eyes and open your mouth. What? Corpus, body, corpse. Good idea, the Latin stupefies them first. Hospice for the dying, they don't seem to chew it, only swallow it down. Rum idea eating bits of a corpse by the cannibals cut into it. He stood aside, watching their blind masks pass down the aisle one by one and seek their places. He approached a bench and seated himself in its corner, nursing his hat and newspapers. These pots we have to wear. We ought to have hats modelled on our heads. They were about him here and there, with heads still bowed in their crimson halters, waiting for it to melt in their stomachs. Something like those mazoth. It's that sort of bread, unleavened showbread. Look at them. Now I bet it makes them feel happy. Lollipop, it does. Yes, bread of angels, it's called. There's a big idea behind it. Kind of kingdom of God is within you, feel. First communicants, hokey pokey penny a lump then feel all like one family party, same in the theatre, all in the same swim. They do, I'm sure of that, not so lonely, in our confraternity. Then come out a big spreeish let of steam. Thing is, if you really believe in it, Lourdes cure, waters of oblivion and the knock apparition, statues bleeding. Old fella asleep near that confession box. Hence those snores, blind faith, safe in the arms of kingdom come, lulls all pain, wake this time next year. He saw the priest stow the communion cup away, well in and kneel an instant before it, showing a large grey boot sole from under the lace affair he had on. Suppose he lost the pinahes, he wouldn't know what to do. 
mm, bald spot behind, letters on his back. I N R I? No, I H S. Molly told me one time I asked her, I have sinned, or, or no, I, I, I've suffered, I've suffered it is. And the other one, iron nails ran in. Meet one Sunday after the rosary. Do not deny my request. Turn up with a veil and black bag. Dusk and the light behind her, she might be here with a ribbon round her neck and do the other things all the same on the sly. That character, that fellow that turned Queen's evidence on the Invincibles, he used to receive the, Carey was his name, the communion every morning. This very church, Peter Carey, number, no, Peter Claver. I am thinking Dennis Carey. And just imagine that. Wife and six children at home and plotting the murder all the time. Those craw thumpers. Hmm. Now that's a good name for them. There's always something shifty looking about them. They're not straight men of business either. Oh no, she's not here, the flower. No, no. By the way, did I tear up that envelope? Yes, under the bridge. The priest was rinsing out the chalice. Then he tossed off the dregs smartly. Wine makes it more aristocratic than, for example, if he drank what they're used to, Guinness's porter or some temperance beverage, Wheatley's Dublin hot bitters or Cantrell and Cochrane's ginger in, aromatic. Doesn't give them any of it, show wine, only the other, cold comfort, pious fraud, but quite right. Otherwise, it'd have one old boozer worse than another coming along, cadging for a drink. Queer the whole atmosphere of the, uh, quite right, perfectly right, that is. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music, pity. Who's the organ here, I wonder? Old Glynn, he knew how to make the instrument talk. The vibrato. Fifty pounds a year, they say, he had in Gardner Street. Molly was in fine voice that day, the Stabat Mater of Rossini. Father Bernard Vaughan's sermon first. Christ or Pilate? Christ, but don't keep us all night over it. Music they wanted. Foot drills stopped. Could hear a pin drop. I told her to pitch her voice against that corner. I could feel the thrill in the air, the full, the people looking up. Qui est homo? Some of that old sacred music is splendid. Morca Donci, seven last words, Mozart's twelfth mass, the glory are in that. Those old popes were keen on music, on art and statues and pictures of all kinds. Palestrina, for example, too. They had a gay old time when it lasted. Healthy too, chanting, regular hours, then brew liqueurs, benedicting, green chartreuse. Still, having a eunuchs in their choir, that was coming in a bit thick. What kind of voice is it? it? Must be curious to hear after their own strong basses, connoisseurs. Suppose they wouldn't feel anything after. Kind of a placid, no worry, falls into fleshes, don't they? Gluttons, tall, long legs, who knows? Eunuch. One way out of it. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar, and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him, and then stood up, looking over the risen hats. Stand up at the gospel, of course, then all settled down on their knees again, and he sat back quietly in his bench. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass boy answered each other in Latin. Then the priest knelt down and began to read off a card. O oh God, our refuge and our strength. Mr. Bloom put his face forward to catch the words. English, throw them the bone. I remember slightly. Ah, how long since your last mass? Gloria and Immaculate Virgin. Joseph, her spouse, Peter and Paul. Uh, more interesting if you understood what it was all about. Wonderful organization, certainly. Goes like clockwork, confession. Everyone wants to. Then I will tell you all, penance, punish me, please. Great weapon in their hands, more than Dr. Rawson is at a women dying to. And I, sha, 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 sha. and did you, ta, 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 ta. and why did you? Look down at her ring to find an excuse. Whispering gallery walls have ears. Husbands, 
learn to his surprise, God's little joke, then out she comes. Repentance, skin deep, lovely shame, pray at an altar, hail Mary and holy Mary, flowers, incense, candles melting, hides her blushes, salvation, army, blatant imitation, reformed prostitute will address the meeting, how I found the Lord, square-headed chaps, those must be in Rome, they work the whole show, and don't they rake in the money too, bequests also to the PP, for the time being, in his absolute discretion. Masses for the repose of my soul to be said publicly with open doors. Monasteries and convents. The priests in the Fermanagh will case in the witness box. No brow beating him. He had his answer pat for everything. Liberty and exaltation of our holy mother, the church. The doctors of the church, they mapped out the whole theology of it. The priest prayed. Blessed Michael Archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of our souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over, the women remained behind. Thanksgiving. Better be shoving along. Brother Buzz, come around with the plate, perhaps. Pay your Easter duty. Hi, my name is Michael Schwartz, and I'm a writer and director here in Brooklyn, New York. He stood up. Oh, hello. Were these two buttons of my waistcoat open all the time? Hmm, women enjoy it. Annoyed if you don't. Why didn't you tell me before? Never tell you, but we... Uh, excuse me, miss, there's a... Uh, miss, there's a... Fluff. Or the skirt behind, placket unhooked. Glimpses of the moon. Still, I like you better untidy. Good job it wasn't farther south. He passed, discreetly buttoning, down the aisle and out through the main door into the light. He stood a moment, unseen by the cold black marble bowl, while before him and behind two worshippers dipped furtive hands in the low tide of holy water. Trams, a car of Prescott's dye works, a widow in her weeds, notice because I'm in mourning myself. Hmm, he covered himself. How goes the time? Uh, it's a quarter past. Uh, time enough yet. Better get that lotion made up. Ah, where is this? Ah, yes, the last time Sweeney's and Lincoln Place. Chemists rarely move. Their green and gold beacon jars too heavy to stir. Hamilton Long's founded in the year of the flood. Huguenot Churchyard near there. Visit someday. He walks southward along Westland Row. Oh, but that recipe, it's in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latchkey too. Bore this funeral affair. Oh well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Um, wait. Oh, I changed a sovereign, I remember. First of the month it must have been, um, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in his prescriptions book. The chemist, he turned back page after page, sandy shriveled smell he seems to have, uh, shrunken skull and old. Quest for the philosopher's stone, the alchemists. Drugs age you after mental excitement? Lethargy then, why? Uh, reaction, a lifetime in a night gradually changes your character, living all the day among herbs, ointments, and disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots, mortar and pestle, uh, ac dist full lord to be rid. Mm. Oh, the smell, hmm, almost cure you like the dentist's doorbell. Dr. Whack, well, he ought to physic himself up a bit. Electuary or emulsion. The first fellow that picked an herb to cure himself, he had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to 
chloroform you. Oh, uh, test turns blue litmus paper red, chloroform, overdose of laudanum, sleeping droughts, uh, love filters, pagoric poppy syrup bad for cough, clogs the, uh, clogs the pores or the phlegm, poisons the only cures, remedy when you least expect it. Clever of nature. Uh, about a fortnight ago, sir. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling the keen reek of drugs, the dusty, dry smell of sponges and loofahs. A lot of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Uh, sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said, and, and then the orange flower water certainly did make her skin so delicate, white like wax. Uh, and white wax also, he said, brings out the darkness of her eyes, looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes, Spanish, smelling herself when I was fixing the links in my cuffs. Those homely recipes, they're the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rainwater, oatmeal, they say, seeped in buttermilk, skin food. One of the old queen's soul, uh, sons, um, it, uh, the Duke of Albany, was it? He had only one skin, Leopold, yes, three, we have. Warts, bunions, and pimples, to make it worse. But you want a perfume too. What perfume does your... Ah. Po de España. That orange flower, that pure curd soap. Water is so fresh. Oh, nice smell these soaps have. Time to get a bath around the corner. Hammam, Turkish, massage, you know, dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nicer if a nice girl did it. Also, I think I, um, yes, I, uh, I do it in the bath. Curious longing, I, water to water, combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage, feel fresh then all day, funeral be rather glum. Uh, yes, sir, the chemist said. Uh, that was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? Uh, no, Mr. Bloom said. Uh, make it up, please. I'll call later in the day and um, I'll take one of those soaps. Uh, how much are they? Uh, four pence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. Mm, sweet lemony wax. Uh, I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Mm, yes, sir kind of said. Uh, you can pay all together, sir, when you come back. Good, Mr. Bloom said. He strolled out of the shop, the newspaper baton under his armpit, the cool wrappered soap in his left hand. At his armpit, Bantam Lyon's voice in hand said, uh, hello, Bloom, uh, what's that news today? I is that today? Show us a minute. Oh, he shaved off his mustache again. By Jove, long, cold upper lip to look younger. Oh, it does look mm, balmy. Mm, younger than I am. Bantam, Bantam Lion's yellow black nailed fingers unrolled the baton. He wants a wash too. Take off that rough dirt. Uh, good morning. Have you used pear soap? God, dandruff on his shoulders. Scalp wants oiling. I want to see about that French horse that's running today, Bantam Lyon said. Uh, where the bugger is it? He rustled the pleated pages, jerking his chin on his high collar. Barber's itch. Tight collar, you know, he'll lose his hair. Better leave him the paper and get shut on him. Uh, you can keep it, Mr. Bloom said. Ascot. Gold cup. Wait, Mr. Bantam muttered. Uh, half a mull, maximum the second. But I was just going to throw it away, Mr. Bloom said. Bantam Lyons raised his eyes suddenly and leered weakly. Oh, what's that? His sharp voice said. I say you can keep it, Mr. Bloom answered. I, I was going to throw it away at the moment. 
Bantam lines doubted an instant, leering, then thrust the outspread sheets back on Mr. Bloom's arms. I'll risk it, he said. Here, thanks. He sped off toward Conway's corners. Godspeed, Scott! Mr. Bloom folded the sheets again to a neat square and lodged the soap in it, smiling. Silly lips of that chap, betting. Regular hotbed of it lately, messenger boys stealing to put on sixpence, raffle for large tender turkey, your Christmas dinner for threepence, Jack Fleming embezzling to gamble, then smuggled off to America, keeps a hotel now. They never come back, flesh pots of Egypt. He walked cheerfully towards the mosque of the baths. Remind you of a mosque red baked bricks, the minarets. Hmm. College sports today, I see. He eyed the horseshoe poster over the gate of College Park. A cyclist doubled up like a cod in a pot. Damn bad ad. Now, if they had made it round like a wheel, then the spokes, sports, 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 and, and the hub, big, college. Something to catch the eye. There's Hornblower standing at the Porter's Lodge. Keep him on hands. Might take a turn in there on the nod. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Hornblower? How do you do, sir? Oh, heavenly weather, really. Hmm. If life was always like this. Cricket weather. Sit around under sunshades. Over and over. Out. They can't play it here. Duck for six wickets. Still, Captain Buller broke a window in the Kildare Street Club with a slog to square leg. Dunnybrook fair more in their line, and the skulls we were cracking when McCarthy took the floor. Heat wave won't last. Mm. Always passing the stream of life, which in the stream of life we trace is dearer than them all. Mm. Enjoy a bath now clean trough of water, cool enamel, the gentle, tepid stream. <sighs> this is my body. Mm. He foresaw his pale body reclined in it, at full, naked, in a womb of warmth, oiled by scented melting soap, softly laved. He saw his trunk and his limbs rip rippled over and sustained, buoyed lightly, upward, lemon yellow, his navel, but of flesh, and saw the dark, tangled curls of his bush floating, floating hair of the stream around the limp father of thousands, a languid, floating flower. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of The Colophon and our centennial reading of Ulysses from Thornwillow Press. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts, and please consider supporting us by visiting our website, www.thornwillow.com. Your help makes this and all our endeavors possible.